All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of happy that Hannah couldn't make it, so I I'm here. But um, I hope that uh, that it will be interesting for you. So I'm gonna will introduce you a bit to neutron imaging um, and especially uh, what can be done in life science. So I'm going to focus more on neutron tomography and some of uh, biomechanics. So as a quick overview of, uh, of this lecture today, um, I'm going to present a bit about like introduction to neutron imaging. Um, what you need to know also is like I'm not a physicist, I'm a biomechanical researcher, so I'm not an expert in, uh, in neutron imaging, but I've been using it for my research. Um, so I've, I've come to know some details and to understand a bit how it works. And I, I think it's, um, it's a fascinating um, technique to look at, uh, well, structure and, and composition and objects in general. Um, so then I will have a little quiz uh, if we have some time for you to look into that. And then I'm going to go into, uh, well, some application for new imaging uh, and especially in life science. And just at the end, some guidelines for the exercise session because I Unfortunately, I couldn't join you, uh, can't join you to the, this afternoon because I have something else in parallel. So first, um, I think so far, um, looking at your backgrounds, because I had access to your to your backgrounds a bit, I think you are uh, more looking at proteins or the lower scale, so more neutron diffraction or neutron scattering, uh, which are really looking at like lower scales, crystals um, and the type of, uh, of levels. With neutron imaging uh, or neutron microscopy or radiography, we're looking at uh, direct structures, so really uh, imaging uh, the structure itself. And it's more in uh, dimension from micron, above a micron to millimeter. So it's just to put in like what scale of the uh, analysis we are now. So what is imaging? Well, imaging is a visual representation of an object. And there are a lot of different imaging types that could exist. Photography is one, uh, cinematography is one with movement. Then a lot of medical imaging also exists. Uh, you maybe had one uh, radiograph when you uh, well, broke a bone or hit an unexpected get a fracture. Molecular imaging is also one, acoustic and neutron imaging, the one we're gonna talk about today. Imaging has been really uh, useful for the community, uh, scientific community and medical community. And here is a bit of uh, some list of Nobel Prizes that has been, have been um, related to some of the imaging uh, breakthroughs. Uh, with the discovery of X-rays in the 1901, that was again. Um, then the computed tomography, which is the technique I've been using and I'm gonna talk a bit about today. And um, then electron microscopy, also a breakthrough. And um, MRI, that has also been a breakthrough in the 2000s and is really widely used nowadays in, um, in medicine and also in imaging uh, in the industrial uh, to image uh, semiconductor. And, and everything. So yeah, imaging is really used a lot in science and it's been, I think, uh, more and more used, and uh, especially in neutron uh, imaging. So before going a bit in the technique, I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of where, uh, if you are ever interested in uh, doing some or applying a neutron imaging to your science, where you can find uh, beam lines that actually do that. Because, well, you've been having a, a doctoral school in the neutrons, so you know that it's not easy to find neutrons and you need some uh, nuclear power plant or a collation source. So, this list is not exhaustive, but the idea is to just present some of the imaging beam lines that can exist. Um, uh, you guys are going to have one in Sweden uh, at the ESS, though it's not going to be operational soon. I don't know exactly uh, if you have the, the, the new dates, but uh, I've heard about 2023, 2025, but there's going to be one at the Unitron Imaging, Odin. Then in uh, Grenoble, in, uh, at the ILL, and there is the D50, uh, also called next to Grenoble, which can do neutron and X-ray uh, at the same time. But unfortunately, this one is going to shut down for improvements soon, for a bit more than a year. Uh, but then there are others across Europe. So there is one um, in Munich in Germany. Um, there is another one in Switzerland, uh, in PSI. And then also uh, around the globe, though, in Day Park and in the USA, uh, there are others. So it was just like to show that you have some options and then 
um, I guess also this afternoon you're going to have some exercise uh, in writing your own proposal to the line. Uh, what you need to, to know is like find and um, um, compare the characteristics of every beam line to, well, to decide which one is, is the best for your research. Okay, so now let's try to move on to a bit of the basics of neutron imaging. So uh, neutron imaging is used to see the inside of materials. And they're able to penetrate material layers of a certain thickness. Um, and this will depend on the attenuation properties of uh, that material. So we can simplify it as a non-destructive because we don't need to cut it, uh, the material to actually see inside, a uh, visualization method. So you can have access as a structure of, of the inside of your sample. So it is based on the interaction with matter. And um, so in a, our case with neutrons, for example, we have a source and we're going to hit with this source and with the neutron, our object. And what's going to happen here between the neutrons and the object is like uh, the, the neutrons could be absorbed by the sample, could be scattered, um, which then would be, we would look at uh, with the neutron scattering, or can be transmitted. And with neutron imaging, we're looking at those uh, transmitted uh, neutrons. And those transmitted neutrons, um, they have some information about the structure because of the different material that you have inside. And this is linked to uh, the attenuation coefficient of the material. And here is just a parallel between X-rays and neutrons because X-rays, it may be something you've also heard about or maybe you used before in research, but to show a bit the differences and the complementarity in between the techniques, the X-rays interact with the electron uh, cloud of an atom and they would um, then kick out and have a, a emission of uh, photons um, to be detected by detector. So the attenuation coefficient when using X-rays are basically linked to the atomic, so here on the left, sorry, atomic number of the sample. So the, the light element like hydrogen, they have like two, one, two electron, they are uh, fairly transparent to X-rays and the heavier they are, the more electrons they are, the trickier the X-rays are to go through. With neutrons, it's a bit different interaction because the neutrons interact with the nucleus. So they're not uh, depending on the electron cloud, which makes the, um, the attenuation coefficient not linear among the periodic table. And which also explains that uh, what is called light atom, like hydrogen, uh, because they have a low mass of the atom, they have a small, no, low number of electrons. Uh, so you can't see them with x-rays, but you can see them a lot with neutrons. So what researchers play a lot on, and we're going to see that in the future, is this different interaction between x-rays and neutrons to see different uh, materials inside your sample. So this is what we use then to have an image after we uh, hit our samples with neutrons. This attenuation coefficient uh, will be integrated in the, in the flux or the in intensity of the neutron that we have after the sample. So uh, the, the neutron imaging is based on the beer lambda flow. Uh, we get the intensity after uh, the interaction with the sample, which is uh, dependent on the intensity before that we know and the attenuation coefficient of the material that we have inside. So then with this, we have some information coming out, but compared to X-rays where it's easy to just detect a photon with a conventional method, here you still have neutrons and you can't detect a neutron itself. So you need a secondary uh, interaction um, to generate usually with scintillators, uh, photons out of the neutron that were uh, passed through the samples. And then you detect those uh, photons with conventional uh, detector system like the camera. So here, um, after this first pass, I think what you need to remember is that neutrons are um, highly absorbed by hydrogen, so they're uh, good candidates to be seen by neutrons, and they're fairly transparent to metal. And then uh, compared to x-rays, you have different interaction and different attenuation coefficient, which makes the techniques complementary. And globally, uh, neutron imaging um, will give you less uh, flux, so less resolution of your image compared to X-rays. Uh, if you have any question, by the way, I, I, as I go, you just interrupt me or you keep them for the end, it's, it's as you prefer. So 
here and uh, now to go to start to go back to a bit life science i'm gonna start to, to, to show you some examples of, of um, life uh, science applications so um, in my research uh, specifically i work in um, bone um, also the interaction with implants which are made of metals often and bone so um, here is to example to to show what a radiography is so radiography is a 2d image so we have a sample, so here is a tibia of a rat with a metal implant in here. We shoot neutron at it, and we have a 2D projection of our sample. So this, you can see, is, is an image in 2D. We have, it's, it's gonna be um, made of pixels that is gonna be linked to the resolution of our detector. And here, the level, the gray level in each pixel of this image would be linked to the attenuation coefficient of our samples. And in our case here, it's average um, over the whole uh, thickness of our sample. But this is a 2D. And what we can do also is go through tomography, which is basically an advanced form of uh, radiography, where the sample is rotated as long as you take a radiograph. And with this, you have multiple projections or multiple radiographs that you can then reconstruct into a 3D volume, which will then be made of voxels instead of pixels because they are 3D, but still containing uh, information in terms of gray level, uh, depending on how much the, the, the material that was in the path of the neutron has been absorbing or not the, the neutron. So once you have that, also an, another important step uh, in the process of, of neutron imaging is the image analysis behind, because it's nice you have a um, 3D, 3D uh, visualization of your samples, but then you need to extract some uh, meaningful information out of it. Um, and this would include uh, some filtering to get rid of noise if you have in your image, segmentation to isolate parts of the different tissues or parts of the sample that you want to look at, and then quantification of different parameters, for example, here, has shown some uh, region of interest that we've been looking at in this uh, in this bone to quantify the bone structure and the bone quantity uh, and especially here you can see around the implant that, that, that we've been interested in. Um, there are different software that exists for that. Uh, in the exercise session this afternoon I made you a tutorial to uh, start to use ImageJ or PT which is commonly used as an import source um, software commonly used by, uh, by the community um, and you, you learn a bit to interact with your with your images and see what you can get out of it so that was the the little quiz that i wanted to make you uh, now that we've um, gone through a bit of of the basics here and uh, to have you brainstorm a bit about like i'll give you three examples of um, uh, situation, scientific situation that we have. And then you could uh, think a bit about what technique would be more adapted, uh, neutron and or X-ray imaging based on what we discussed and uh, some information here in the, in the blue rectangle, which gives you some hints um, in the, from what we discussed already. So first uh, example is you're in front of a lead tank which seems sealed, and you're a bit wondering, can I open it or not? So you have this, and you're a bit stuck. And then you also found a small suspect rock uh, in uh, Yvonne. So I've been asking a Swede about the famous uh, archaeological site, and she came with the name Yvonne. But if you don't know, um, it's like you were in some archaeological site, so you are suspecting that maybe it would be more than just a rock. And then you also have a scientific question about uh, can we play a good geological barrier for the disposal of radioactive waste? So um, then maybe you can just have like uh, a let you brainstorm. Uh, your, I mean, you can open your microphone or uh, you can just have, uh, I don't know if it's easy then to make some sub rooms or you just uh, let them think by themselves. I mean, in two minutes, we just. Uh, discuss uh, about options. So what do you think? Guys, do you want to separate in different rooms or do you want to, to uh, just think now? You can think aloud. 
yeah, you can think about, you can think all together and you can have like suggestions. And, and... So let's start to think. Let's start with one room then. Any ideas? So for the first one, we would use uh, neutrons because I think like if you do x-rays, then you would not see through it. Yeah, that's totally correct. So if we go to the first, indeed, you would use neutron to go through uh, the lead because otherwise with x-rays, you won't be, you will just have like a black image basically with x-rays. And now with this neutron, you can see through and what you see is like, well, it seems to be a flower inside and the flower, you see it because it's a lot of hydrogen inside. So it's really absorbing the neutron. And then you say, okay, then it looks safe to open the tank. I should not be intoxicated. Okay, what about the second uh, second example? I don't know if anybody else wants to. I can leave uh, room for any, maybe Jen. <laughs> Jen, are you asleep? Are you awake? <laughs> I know it's so for you. <laughs> um, I I mean I I guess I would guess neutrons if you have a lot of high density elements in there it might be quite hard to get uh, a, well if a, a rock that size it'd be quite hard to get x-rays through anyway yeah totally so neutron for sure uh, because you can get through the rock but also there is like a little hit also in the title it was called the small rock so if it's small it means that you can st still go through it with x-rays and here you could combine because with the neutrons you would go through the rock and then you could see some structure inside like if the fossil was there because it contains more hydrogen compared to the, the sediment that are around uh, but then the x-rays have a finer resolution in terms of, of the pixel size and, and what they can grasp. And here, for example, you could see, well, but be careful, because it seems to be some cracks inside the sample that we couldn't really see because of the, the lower resolution of the neutrons. So with this information, then you can decide or not to work on exposing uh, the treasure that you found inside, but carefully because, you know, well, if I hit here with my little instrument, I might just break my sample. So great. Oh, what about the last one? Well, there is no big, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, I was trying to look for an example that you could not look through with neutrons but the neutrons can be used a lot. So in here, I would also do the same. I combine neutrons and x-rays, but also potentially add something here in your test experiments, which would be in situ testing. And we're gonna go back a bit to it. I'm gonna explain what it is. It's not just imaging in the sense that you have a sample, you put it in the beam line and you look at the structure, but here you want to change the sample to see how the structure would modify uh, if you would like, for example, compress it, or in this case, for example, what is important for a uh, clay or whatever material that is around in the radioactive uh, uh, waste is to not be able to be porous and to have like water flux and then transport any uh, radioactive water into rivers or whatever. So here uh, is an example of work that has been done um, by a team here in, uh, in Grenoble, I think, um, where they compressed a bit to, to fracture basically the clay and then they, put, they push water through it to see how the water would flow and they combine neutron and x-rays also to gain on your resolution and contrast. Um, and this is a way of better understanding the crack propagation in these materials and to see if uh, you can prevent uh, any leaks in the future. Okay, thanks for interacting, that was great. Okay, so now I'm going to move on a bit to more, uh, well, application of neutron imaging, and uh, hopefully I can uh, give you some, uh, well, will to try out on your different projects if you have, uh, if you feel that it would be applicable. Um, here below, I also list some of reviews that can be useful for you, uh, on neutron imaging in general, um, and some focus on life science. 
Um, but in this first slide, I just present some of the non-life science applications because neutron imaging is also used a lot as we've seen before in well, engineering and material science, geology, earth science, and also cultural heritage. So I'm gonna just show you some examples. So here, for example, is a battery um, that has been looked at with a neutron radiography. And this is also an in situ testing in the sense that you see the evolution of the battery with time. So they've been charging the battery and then they let it discharge and then they see how uh, all the lithium inside will move. And it's a good candidate for neutrons because of the interaction um, between the, the passing through of the metal and the interaction with lithium. In geology, uh, as we've seen with, with clay and, and uh, before, um, they also use it a lot uh, because of the power of penetration through heavy materials. Um, the use of fluid flows that you can uh, see through because of water, for example, which has, has a lot of hydrogen, you can see the contrast pretty well, and then you can access porosity, cracks. And here is an example of concrete that has been imaged with both neutron and x-rays. And you can a bit see what different of contrast you could have. So if you have only an X-ray image, you barely see at the grains and matrix, and you can see pores. But then if you combine it with neutrons, you see well the differences in between the different rocks inside. And then you can also push some water and then see where the water will go and then highlight it in more pores. And in another example in, in cultural heritage, for example, is also the use of well, penetration to heavy material. Here is a, a copper statue, for example, and also the fact that it's non-destructive because as the fossil that we've seen before, we don't want to expose to see what is inside and to see what's happening. And in this case, they wanted to, to see if the statue was uh, corrosive, was corroding and where it was. So they, they used that and then they could highlight parts and that can help in uh, better anticipation of the, the preservation techniques or protect the statue and it's also been used a lot in, in critical heritage too as a non-damaged uh, destructive tool. Okay, so now let's try to move on to some example uh, in life science. So the first one is a bit go back to the brainstorming uh, example that has been showing is trying to understand if neutron imaging can be used to access bone structure embedded in fossils. So you have a bunch of rocks you have suspicion that they would contain something and they say, well, can I see through without uh, opening it and without uh, damaging the sample? So this has been used quite a lot because uh, blue specimens are often opaque to x-rays, especially as we said before, if it's a big rock and you have a lot of sediment that or contain heavy materials. So researchers have been using the penetration power uh, of neutron through this rock and through this embedding matrix to be able to see through and to distinguish what is inside. And then they also use the fact that neutron can go through the sediments, but they're gonna be highly absorbed by the hydrogen contained into the fossilized bone. And then they can see the contrast between the bone that is inside and the matrix. Um, so then you can highlight different um, uh, structure. And um, uh, for example, some, some uh, research has been highlighting the vascularity in the bone and see that animals, some of the species could be uh, blood warm animals because they had like uh, vascularity and, and, and vessels inside the bone. And they also use the sensitivity to isotopes. So um, because uh, for the same, uh, for example, hydrogen uh, nucleus, which has half one proton, and um, isotope can contain different numbers of neutrons. Like hydrogen, it has one proton, uh, and deuterium, it has one proton and one neutron. So it means that they're gonna interact differently uh, with the neutron beam. And then with that, we can highlight um, different parts. And I'm gonna show you into the next example, which is more uh, clear. So another example now is botany. Um, and some researchers have wondered if neutron imaging can also be used to track the water replacement and transfer in the plant's roots or in the plants in, in general. And for that, they also use uh, some of the, the quality of the neutron that we've been discussing before, the penetration power uh, through the soil, so uh, through the rocks that can be in the soil, and the fact that I said before that the neutron can distinguish isotopes. So 
In this specific example, for example, they used uh, deuterium and uh, normal water. And what they did is like they soaked the plant in deuterium, which is uh, not poisonous for the plant. And then during the experiment, or at the beginning of the experiment, they inject uh, normal water inside uh, or the bottom of, of the, the soil and they see the water intake. And because uh, uh, normal water has more um, nutrients, uh, it's going to be more absorbent to the nutrients. And then you can see better contrast, or at least a different contrast in between these two. And then you can uh, pro see the propagation of the, of the water plant. Um, so they combine this with this in-situ testing to see the changes of inject water and keep on doing the tomography to have an evolution of, the, of their system. And for that, they also had a requirement, which was to use some uh, fast imaging, because uh, to see the water intake as it's a process, a continuous process, you can't just have like a tomography that would last an hour, and then you want to take another one, but it would be the end of, of your test. So they did that in Grenoble, in ILL, where they can do a really fast scan for 1.5 seconds. So they keep on doing scans, they do one at T0, they inject water, and they repeat until they can come up with those nice images which I'm going to show you here. So we can see, uh, we don't see the, the soil because it's transparent to neutrons, so they, they, they could isolate it with uh, some image analysis after they had the, the, the test done. And you can nicely see the roots, and here what you see in the bottom, in this uh, dark uh, gray or green, is the normal water uh, front that is the getting uh, soaked and coming into the roots and into the soil and it that is replacing the the, the heavy water that you don't see um, because it's more transparent to nutrients but with that you really can see the front and propagation front and that is something used a lot in, in nutrient imaging and also in, in geology uh, to see water uh, flow and intake in different materials to see where if there are leaks or if the rock is cracked where the water would go and where it grows deep um, are. Another example in um, more biological application is in uh, liver tissues. Uh, some researchers ask if uh, neutron imaging could be used to identify tumor. And for that, what they thought is like, well, we can maybe use contrast agents because the tumor itself would not be uh, seen uh, with a nice different contrast uh, with the whole of the tissue because there is no particular uh, differences in material. But if we can come up with nanoparticles which are absorbent to the nutrients and the nanoparticles would um, get attached to the tumor also as a way of, of treating the, the tumor or isolated activity at least the tumor later, then we, we can detect uh, the differences because where the particles are and they absorb more than nutrients and then you can isolate okay parts of the tissue which seems to be a tumor because the nanoparticle um, attached to it. Okay, and then to finish a bit on this, uh, well, the, um, the global uh, biological uh, example and application to life science, I'm going to spend a bit more time in bone research, which is something I'm more familiar with um, because I've been working in, uh, on it during, well, the previous postdoc that I've been doing in Lund University and still uh, now in my, in my current research. So, Bone here is, a, is an example of, of a bone femur. We have um, basically two types of bone tissue in, in the body. You have um, what is called cancellous bone, which is very poor structure, we can see here. And then uh, a, a cortical bone on the outside. But here we're going to focus on the, on, the, on the poorest structure that you have here. So x-rays are often employed in bone research because uh, bone is made of uh, collagen and uh, mineral made of hydroxyapatite. And this mineral is highly absorbent to x-rays. The air uh, is not, so we have a good contrast between what is bone, mineralized tissue, and the rest. Plus the x-rays are usually fast and they give high resolution. So here is an example of a small plug that has been imaged in a synchrotron. Um, so with like three micron resolution of our image, so we can nicely see structure in here. And this is uh, typically what the exercise will be this afternoon. It's going to be that type of stuff. Though we have two more questions or two more um, problems that come up uh, when we want to push a bit the analysis. The x-rays, 
they are not or they're less sensitive to hydrogen-based tissue. And the bone is made of this uh, mineralized tissue, but in between the spores, there is bone marrow that you can see here. Um, and there is also collagen and soft tissue. And all these, uh, all the tissue except bone are also implied uh, in growth and remodeling. So they're interesting to look at. And X-rays are not very good for that because we don't have enough contrast into uh, the rest of the tissue there. And also uh, with a specific application, which is the use of implants uh, to fix some bones. So it could be a hip implant to correct uh, a fracture bone or some screws to, put, uh, to help uh, a fracture bone to heal. Um, titanium implants are commonly used in the clinics, but with x-rays, um, they generate a lot of artifacts in the vicinity of uh, the implant because they're highly absorbed by the metal. So there is a, a huge uh, disproportion between the absorption of the metal and the absorption of the rest of the tissue, which makes um, these artifacts generated during the reconstruction problem, protocol. Um, so what we've been asking uh, ourselves in Lund uh, for the past years is, well, can we try to apply maybe neutron imaging to explore this bone tissue around the implants uh, better than an X-rays or at least uh, complementary than X-rays? So we had two uh, we, we had multiple questions. The first one was like, okay, can neutron then accurately depict bone microarchitecture? Is it, is it still a good technique? Because if we can't see enough of the, the architecture of the bone, it won't be a good candidate. So what we started to do first was to have just imaging uh, with some uh, screws that we implanted in, in rat tibia here. We let them heal. Uh, so we had the bone that will grow onto the implant. And then we scan them with x-rays and with neutrons. And so here I just recap a bit the advantages of the both techniques. So the x-rays is easier or yeah, easier to access it. And the resolution is better. And also usually it's also uh, shorter in terms of, of scan. But with this infant, we have a lot of artifacts here because of the metallic components. The neutrons on their side, the penetrative metal. So you can see here that there are no artifacts um, in, the, in the vicinity of the infant. But the resolution uh, and the imaging time is quite different. So this is a test that we've been done in 2017. So it's already quite old. But for information, um, in terms of time, for example, in between this scan with x-rays that was done with the uh, lab uh, CT, it was like an hour, an hour and a half scan to have a resolution of 3 micron. And if we wanted a resolution of 10 micron at uh, PSI at the at the time that we did the test, it was 10 hours of scan. So we really had a different of compromises to do. But now uh, the time flow, uh, for example, at ILL, as I'm going to show you a new example, has really decreased. And then it's also push up to use neutrons. So it was really a promising uh, test here because we could see that with the X-ray, we had all this uh, pollution of artifacts that you can see here that were not existing in neutrons. So we said, well, it's good. We should continue in using neutrons. So what we did is like, okay, can we push it a bit to see if we can not only see the structure, but try to extract some mechanical information about our uh, tissue. So then we said, well, we can combine, as I've been showing before, with some in situ testing. So basically what we want to do is we put our sample um, inside a little testing machine that has been also put in the beam line, and we're going to pull out the implant while we do some tests. So we're going to do some increments and here is a little video to show you what we did. So here is a bone uh, that we're going through. So we see the different types of bone. We don't really see well the screw because it's, it's not absorbing the neutrons. And what we do is we pull out um, and we take scans at different time of our pull out. So we take a scan first at T0, no damage done to the samples. And then we pull out, we displace the screw open two millimeter and we take a new scan and then we continue on doing that. And what we can see already on the image is some cracks opening. So something is happening, we're damaging the samples. But as I said, it's not enough to just see and have nice images. We really want to have more information and to do some image analysis to track the mechanical damage that was done. So for this specific technique, we used an image analysis technique which is called digital volume correlation. And the idea is to track and the voxel. So basically, we take little cubes in within our image at uh, the first step of loading, 
And then we try to look for the same cube at the second step of loading. And it probably has changed. Either it has moved or it has deformed. And this is the information that we're going to use to get uh, some maps of um, our samples in between two different uh, loading steps. And we can have, sec have access to the displacement. So here you can see uh, the, the, the Y displacement is on the horizontal axis. So we can see that the bone seems to be opening um, and it's coherent with what we see on the scans, the fracture here. And if we transform this displacement into strains, then we can see uh, opening cracks in here, so a fraction, an opening of uh, the bone, and also some compression at some point. So the bone is crushing the mold across this. So there was a, a first um, test of neutron um, pull out on bone, and it was very promising for the rest um, and for the future. And we're keeping on doing some tests at Lynn University or uh, with the group of Hannah exactly. Um, and then we had another question, it's like, okay, so neutron tomography seems to be good, but can we maybe combine it with some of the techniques to better isolate materials inside the bone? Um, so this is uh, related to the, um, the fact that I told you before, in bone with x-rays, we, we will see the bone tissue itself, the mineral part, but all the soft tissue, the marrow, we don't really see them well. So we said, well, maybe we should try to uh, push the analysis in combining neutron and, and x-rays and to see how much we can gain out of this combination of the techniques. Uh, so this is a recent um, test that has been done uh, at ILL uh, where they have um, the neutron and the x-rays in the same beam line at an angle of 90 degrees. So you can do um, almost at the same time, but now it's just right one right at the, after the other without moving the sample the neutron uh, tomography, and then the x-ray tomography. And then you come up with two different type of images, uh, the neutron and the x-rays, and um, using also uh, some image analysis. So here it was image registration. So basically you want to overlap the two images because they are exactly the same sample. And with this overlapping, then you can see what information each phase has in the different uh, modality. So with this one, for example, in these images, what we can see is that the screw that is here, a titanium screw, with the neutron, it doesn't really come up well, so the neutron goes through, but with the x-rays, it's very bright. And you can see, for example, here, some shadow behind the screw that looks real on the, on the x-ray images, but it is just an artifact because, as you see in a neutron, it doesn't exist. There is some bone, and here you look like, well, maybe there is not bone, actually. So this was something really interesting in terms of, of the implant. And then also we can see here in the neutron some uh, lighter gray part that we don't really see coming up in the x-rays. And these are soft tissues. So more fat and bone marrow that contains more hydrogen and they'll pick up better with the neutrons. And so we also pushed it with another technique, histology, that maybe you're also more familiar with. Uh, here is a, a slightly different um, a mo implant model that we've been using, uh, but it's the same principle. We still have a titanium implant and we're putting in contact with bone and we're trying to see where the bone uh, will grow and how will it grow. Um, and here we did not true neutron tomography compared to histology. And in, in this histology slice, we stained to get the mineral mineralized bone. Um, and we had a really good fit between uh, those two images, meaning that every information that we saw in the histological size was also present in the neutron tomography. So neutron is good to see the bone. However, when we tried to fit the other way around, so the neutrons onto the histology, then the fit was a bit less. And what we realized is because neutron uh, images had more information compared to histology, and especially they contain information about the soft tissue that we couldn't see with only the staining of the mineralized bone. And when we stain with another technique to highlight uh, soft tissues and more uh, fatty tissue, we could see this, this blue structure here appearing um, that were labeled as, as soft tissue. That we're also seen in the neutron. And in this study, we didn't do x-rays, but we could have done x-rays. And we wouldn't have been able to also see them in x-rays. So uh, neutron tomography is really good to see the bone and some soft tissue, and we're pushing through all of these techniques to try to understand better uh, what the soft tissues are for and how they could impact in the, in the bone and growth and the modeling. 
Okay, so to finish, I'm just going to try to recap a bit about the take home messages of, of this. Uh, so some advantages of the neutron that we've seen is like it's a high penetration power. Um, it is good to see if any hydrogen um, contained material and it's sensitive to isotopes. So if you have those in the material, you might be interested in trying. It has also a low radiation damage. I haven't really talked about it, but compared to x-rays, which can really damage like plants, for example, right as you, as you use it also because the energy of the beams are different. Neutrons are non-destructive in that way, and you can at least uh, see the evolution of the plant without killing it immediately. And also, they're sensitive to magnetic moments, uh, but that I also haven't talked about it because I'm not uh, an expert on it, but it's also something you might uh, just want to know. Um, neutrons are often um, combined with other techniques, as I've shown you, and mostly x-rays, because then research plays on the different interaction with matter. Then you have to think about the compromise between, uh, well, especially the spatial and the temporal resolution and the access of the technique. In terms of application to live science, um, neutron imaging is used to see inside the samples in resolution from micron to millimeter uh, samples. In fossils, they can go through rocks. In plants, uh, they're used to track water intake. And in bone implants and bone research, they're sensitive to soft tissue and they avoid the generation of metal artifacts. And just to finish, um, if you're ever interested in, in applying neutron imaging, I think what you need to think and to brainstorm about is to know a bit about the composition and the structure of your samples. Because neutron imaging might not always be the answer. And here is an example of our earlier test that we've been doing on our samples. And when the, our bone specimens were too hydrated, well, we couldn't see any structure because basically it was no contrast. So you still need to think about sample preparation and the composition of uh, your samples. Okay, and then um, just some quick uh, guidelines about the exercises for this afternoon, because as I said, I won't be able to join, but the idea is for you to uh, play around with the software uh, and to understand what image analysis can do or can be applied in, uh, well, in for example, here is bone research. Um, and what I'm going to uh, uh, give you is a bit of this uh, coarse cancellous bone extracted with uh, from a femur and you're going to have two plugs one image or oh, it's the same plug actually is one image with neutrons one image with x-rays and the idea is to play around with the different images try to extract some videos like that and try to compare and to see um, with your real eyes and playing around what I've been uh, showing you today, the different interaction and how uh, neutrons and x-rays can be complementary. I think you have access to the downloadable data in, in your uh, link, but I guess uh, you, you didn't know about that. So yeah, with all of this, I thank you for your attention and your interaction during the little quiz. I hope um, it was clear enough um, and if you have any input, or question, or suggestion for the future, it was the first time I gave this lecture, uh, do not hesitate to give me some feedback. And with this, I thank you all, well, my colleagues, because this research is quite heavy. Uh, so I've been interacting with a lot, especially Lund University, uh, with the group of Hannah Isaacson, and also recently in France with the CNRS, and a large facility in Europe. So uh, myself, I've been to Icon, Switzerland, and uh, more often to the DPP Nectron of Nayadi. And uh, the people there have been great always to interact and to build up and to uh, well, um, advise you on, on your project. So yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I'm really happy to try to answer them. So please, questions to Sophie and uh... First, I would like to thank uh, you for a very clear and uh, informative uh, 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 presentation. I think it's very important to, when you look into technique and, and uh, discussing scientific results, it's very important to see the parallel between the material science and life science, and you can really learn from each other and the people who are in material saying, uh, science says, oh, life science is so complicated, we can't understand it. But I think <laughs> you have shown that it's it's not exactly true. So um, 
you can actually get an enormous amount of useful information out of it. So, so yeah. please, please, uh, is there anybody who want to say something? Uh, I have a question. Maybe I missed uh, um, the idea of uh, neutron imaging is also used for uh, NMR. Uh, Sorry, MRI, you mean? Or no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's, it's a it's a different technique. It's not the it's not the same because uh, MRI is magnetic resonance imaging, and it use uh, it's on the magnetic field of uh, you apply a magnetic field, and then you have your molecules that will shift and responds differently to this magnetic field. So you will see things, but it's not linked to neutrons. We don't use the same technique, um, but it's uh, it's a 3D visualization technique in the same sense, but it's not the same interaction with matter that you've been using, if I answer correctly. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. I think you can say also what Tony said, uh, Tony was said uh, when he compared a, new, a neutron and a scattering techniques with NMR. NMR is basically looking at distances that are very small and are using the, the changes in, in um, coupling between entities on these distances to produce an image. So in this case, we just we look at it like we look at it with light, or uh, but we use neutrons instead. So we 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 create. That's how we create in. Um, image so 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 the information you get is different and in some cases very complementary so so yeah exactly it's yeah it's, it's an imaging technique so you can image uh, the same sample with different techniques and then you would see different things and then you can play on this to understand better what is inside and how it is made of um, after yeah okay thank you for explanation so, so is there a, is there a, another question for Sophie? That's one uh, one raised hand I can see. Jen, oh, hey, uh, just a kind of uh, well. First of all, thank you for it's a it's a really interesting um, presentation because I think we've been doing a lot of scattering which can feel like quite far removed <laughs> from what the sample actually looks like so it's really cool to see kind of real space uh, neutron stuff especially with like large really large and uh, samples um, but just a more practical question for the measurement time um, with neutron imaging um, what kind of measurement time do you need to get good resolution and especially comparing kind of a uh, 2D, so I guess if you're just yeah, get like straight through the sample compared to tomography, because you look like yeah, the 1.5 second exactly um, time resolution would that be kind of obviously that's very short. But, um, do you get good resolution with that? So with that, you have something around 100 micron uh, resolution in the pixel size. Uh, so it's true that if you want to push further down uh, in terms of so I think uh, nowadays the the maximum resolution that can be reached is around four micron pixel, but then it will get hours into scanning. So for example, in our test that we've been doing, to have a really good resolution of like six, seven micron, we had like eight and nine hours scan. But though it's always a combination of like how um, small you want to see, how good of a resolution you want to have in between your images, and how, yeah, how long you can wait. In this case, for example, with the fans, they could not wait that long because they wanted to see an improve and change. So if you have something that's a phenomenon that is uh, well, taking some time in terms of seconds, uh, you have to go fast and then you have to lose in resolution. But if you can uh, wait uh, more, then you can push the resolution and get uh, well, better images. But that's a good question. It's, it's true, it's down to that and then it's uh, also, the techniques are improving a lot, and uh, they're really getting in through like high resolution, higher flux. Also, depends on the flux and the nutrients you have um, at first. Uh, so, I think at ESS you're going to have like a huge flux, probably the best in Europe. So then, if you have more neutron at first, then you can also reduce the time in that way because you have more, more neutron to interact. So the image behind is, uh, is clearer. Here, you need to push with exposure time because you have to have more neutron with more information to get. That's also why it's longer. Thank you. 
some more comments for uh, for Sophie or some questions. I, I guess also one can. It's fair to say, uh, Sophie, that that um, neutron imaging is a, is a fairly new uh, thing. It's a fairly new and. Uh, one of the challenges is the, the detector and uh, uh, resolution and things like that, and the sensitivity of the detector and so on. And yeah, that, definitely. That it, yeah, but in, yeah, yeah. it's a rather, it's rather, a, it's a simple, um, it, it's simple setup in a way. In in principle, it's a simple setup, but. Uh, and it's a yeah, I mean, here is, for example, the, the basics of it. I mean, you have a scintillator to transform the neutrons into, into photons, and then you get a camera. Uh, so usually the setups can be like super simple if you only want the image, and then it can become very complicated if we want to do in situ testing, like when they do it in geomechanics, they have like pressure and compression, pressure rocks, and they want to push in through, and that complicates a bit the setup, but itself behind. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's down to, to that. But that's also limits the resolution. So if they want to go deeper and, and, and smaller resolution, I guess they will have to develop more technique. And that's, uh, I'm not an expert in that, to be honest. But, uh, but if you want to look into that, I mean, maybe you can uh, ask some, some physicists, I guess, you have contact to that. And they can give also a very nice, uh, deep presentation into the physics um, of this. In ASS, we will have a very nice female. Yeah. Within, uh, Whatever they call it, so so yeah. so there is a, there is a bit of development in the field. Oh, Ying, Ying has a question. Ying? Yeah, um, I just want to ask a very basic question: the difference between the neutron imaging and neutron scattering. Um, neutron imaging is also a detection of intensity and. But it is like um, a shadow of the neutron light, uh, no, the neutron beam. But um, so is it like the major difference is that for neutron scattering, we measure the intensity at different angle, but for neutron imaging, we measure it at like a plat um, screen of det detector. Can I understand it like this? Yeah, so maybe it's only you can help me a bit answering this question because I'm not an expert in scattering. But uh, in neutron imaging, what you look at uh, is the transmitted neutrons that is shown here. So you have the neutron coming in and they interact and they can be scattered. And if, if you look at the scattered neutron, then you're doing neutron scattering and they have different information about the structure uh, down to the to the element, like the crystal uh, structure and, and this type of yeah. dimension. And when, the is how can we how can we tell which is the scattered light and which is the transmitted? Because the scattered, you don't see it behind the sample because it's been scattered around, uh, it's been deviated basically. So yeah, at different angles, and that's what you you look at. Get small scattered, then it will uh, give you information onto some dimension of the crystal, and wide angles will give you dimension in, in other. Uh, because because the neutron will yeah they will hit and then they will get deviated and in imaging you just look at it transmitted and and this is the information you look so whatever is not behind the sample uh, you would not uh, look at with the neutron imaging I guess is, I mean Tommy you can just like pop into explain a bit more if you're familiar very, with scattering good, a very good explanation so so if you look if you look to do the same thing with a, in a scattering experiment you can see it's all all hidden in the what we call the direct beam, and usually you mask it out when you do a scattering. Yeah. So you have a, a beam stopper or some some thing that you, you because you don't want it to to uh, it to interfere with your scatter signal. But and yeah. also that one can say that the scattered information, so to speak, is. Is given information on the smaller distances. It's fair to say, I think so. So, and Yen Yen has another question. Just on the same um, kind of follow on from Ching, I guess. Um, but in uh, so a small angle neutron scattering, for example, 
like the, the angles that you're looking at are kind of very small yeah. so in that case if there was kind of that that you know 0 0.3 degrees um angle kind of scattering would that uh act as like noise in this case or like background um and just decrease your resolution yeah, I think they will, they will indeed uh, blur a bit your image because they will, I mean, some neutrons are going through and they're going to be just behind where they hit, but some are just like shift a bit and then they're going to pollute the next pixel because basically they should not have been there, but they've been scattered by something else. And that indeed gives some blur in the image. And I think there are techniques uh, to remove that if you place like grids um, before and then you image your sample with like a grid in different position then you can try to mask out this scattered uh, neutron uh, from the images and gain a bit in, in image quality, but I'm not very an expert in that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. I think it's, it's a lot of this uh, to me. I mean, it, it, in fact, that is also something to take into account. There's also uh, techniques that are developing uh, that are very advanced that, that um, you can use the fact that neutrons are also small uh, magnets, so there is a, a, a emerging field of polarized uh, neutron image mm. scattering. So you can separate out more the scattering signal from the imaging, and so on, mm. and vice versa. So, so it's it's a it's an advancing field. So, so Susanna. Yeah, and also, I mean, just to, to complete on that, uh, in terms of how many neutrons are scattered and transmitted, more and transmitted, so there are going to be some neutrons that pollute the image, but it's also, I mean, less in proportion to whatever goes through, so it pollutes a bit, but it's not changing drastically the information of the image. Um, yes, so I was thinking about what is the smallest sample you can actually put and get some kind of reasonable data? Um, well, the pixel resolution that can be uh, achieved now, I think, is like four micron. So you definitely need something bigger than that. Um, yeah. But in terms of, uh, well, like for example, in our samples, we were like in terms of one centimeter or even um, below in terms of, of dimension. But when they look at like batteries and stuff, they could look like the small, you know, flat batteries that you can put in your in your watch or whatever. And this, they can be imaged also uh, nicely with resolution of four microns. So um, below four micron uh, is not reachable, but then whatever is on, on this uh, size, I think you should be able to. Okay, so it's actually smaller than I thought. Yeah, it's getting smaller and smaller. It's true that, uh, well, as I said, when I when I reached, uh, I started to use it like a couple of years ago, 2017, the best resolution was like, 15 or a 20 micron and now it's really shifting and you can really see it better it depends on the flux and it's, it's really improving fast what are you okay. working on i think you're mostly working on them coating some really down and no i was actually thinking about like putting insects yeah definitely i, I haven't shown it yet in this one because uh, i think for insects, for example, I think X-rays are still more used because um, you still can get very high resolution with X-rays. So to run the steering really vessels on the tails is still better. Um, but it's been used a bit uh, to try to see if they can yeah, detect some new things with the neutrons compared to X-rays. Um, but for, for insects, I would suggest to try X-rays and also maybe uh, phase contrast X-rays. Because um, if you don't have enough absorption, then uh, difference in absorption in, in your insect because everything looks the same to the x-rays. You can work on the on the structure and the phase shift of the x-rays and that would highlight the, well, the structure of yours. And I think for um, bees and some uh, flies has been used, um, they have uh, cool results into this. So you can, I think in Lund there are some also looking into um, bees' eyes so I can understand the structure there is a team working on. Yeah, I, I have seen a paper uh, in x-rays when they did um, like a, a regular fly flapping wings. Yeah, definitely. So, so there is one I know. Of, so you should, um, 
yeah, look for it. And it's like a very good image, like 3D, like you can rotate it and see like a lot of um, like comp components like uh, moving and yeah, fluid. Yeah. So there is definitely yeah. something out there. Yeah. And that was done also because it's faster resolution. I mean, you can, if you want to see the fly first with x-rays, it's, it's dangerous because the fly will eventually die after a couple of seconds because it's basically fried during the test. But I think what they've done is like they recorded multiple flying uh, and then they, they, uh, they, they shifted like they, they just took like one in each cycle of flying an instant that was just a bit after. But you still need to have fast images to be able to see one flat in one scan. So that's why the expert is still secure in that sense, I think. Okay, thank it's you. The advantage with neutrons is uh, that the fly doesn't die. Yeah, it's, it's less so. aggressive. Yes, that's yeah. true. So it's a more. Well, eventually it will die because you still cause some decay and, and, and I mean, but uh, not as uh, aggressive as the X-ray in the direct. I think for plants it's also motivation because the plants can still live and take some water intake, and you can see on multiple hours of, of the test where for X-rays it will just instantly die, and then you don't see anything.